Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'd like to call the meeting uh, in order. We have, um, this morning we have regrets from Drew Bucknell, uh, Daniela Hampton Davies, and Brenda Sweeney. Uh, welcome to the Virtual Heritage Oakville Advisory Committee meeting, which includes staff and members of the public. All delegations are required to pre-register with the clerk's department by noon the day before the meeting. There are three registered delegations for today's meeting. Delegations are reminded that they have 10 minutes to speak to an item on the agenda. ITS staff will be controlling the presentations for staff members and the public. Uh, the agenda and materials are available on oakville.ca under town hall agendas and, meet and minutes. Committee members will be muted during the meeting, and should you have questions, I ask that you physically raise your hand. Uh, Madam Clerk, I might need your help on this because I'm working from an iPad and I can't get all the participants on one screen, so I'll need some assistance. I will make a speaker's list and once called upon by myself, I will ask that you unmute yourself and ask your questions. And please mute yourself once you're done speaking. We have five discussion items on the agenda today. And should at any time during the meeting you lose connection um, or have any issues, please email townclerk at oakville.ca. Um, any applicant or member of the public wishing to speak further regarding an issue on the Heritage Oakville Advisor Committee on this agenda for today may appear before Planning and Development Council at its meeting on Monday, September 13th at 6.30 p.m. when the recommendations from today's meeting will go forward for final consideration by Council. Um, and I have mentioned the regrets that we have this morning. Do we have any declarations of pecuniary interest today? Seeing none, we'll go forward. Um, uh, can we have a confirmation as of minutes of previous meeting? Any issues or comments regarding Councillor Dudek? And I don't see any other Yes, Councillor Duddick. I said I'm just moving the Madden chair. Thank you very much. We have a motion to uh, move the confirmation for the confirmation of minutes of the previous meeting. I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Giddings. Madam Chair, for committee, yes. we only require one mover, and the motion is to approve the minutes. Okay, so we have a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, and now the minutes are approved. Am I on target, um, Madam Clerk? Madam Chair, carried. Okay, thank you. Um, item four, discussion item 4.1, a heritage presentation uh, for application on 105 Palliser Court for the new detached garage. I think Carolyn is um, going to present this one for us. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll just wait for the presentation. So this property is at 105 Palliser Court. It's located on Lakeshore Road West. Um, and I'll go to the next slide. It was um, always located in this general location, but around 2007, 2008, there was a redevelopment of the site and the house was turned um, with its orientation towards the west as opposed to Lakeshore. And a new smaller subdivision with new homes was constructed uh, on the rest of the property. So the house we're dealing with today is just the one that you can see marked by the red dot on the right image. And um, as you can see, this house is the heritage home on a larger lot. The rest of the homes are, um, are the newer homes within the new subdivision. We'll go to the next slide. So again, it is designated individually, it was designated in 2010, and it contains the 1853 Reverend George Washington House. It's a two-story brick Regency cottage. 
And again, the house was located about 13, 14 years ago. And the proposal now today, which you have before you with the heritage permit, is to construct a detached two-car frame garage. Next. Here are just some images of the property you can see um, from Google Street View. And when the, the house was relocated at the time, there were some thoughts to construct a, an attached garage, which was not supported by staff. And so at the time, it was left just with a new driveway, anticipating that in the future, the applicants or owners would rather would come back with a, an application to construct a new detached garage. So that's what we're dealing with today. Next. It's just a view from Lakeshore. Next. And just a view closer up. Next. This is a view from the rear yard looking uh, towards where the garage would be. Next. Here's a site plan. So again, we've got the house on the bottom and the proposed garage in uh, the darker gray to the north. And you can see that it's set back from the house and uh, detached from the house as well. Next. Very simple garage. So just two doors for the vehicles, the front and a personal door at the back. Next. A simple hip, hip roof. Next. And here's some elevation drawings. Uh, the proposal is to do wood siding with the cream color to match the wood siding on the addition at the rear of the house. Next. Again, this is the view from the north. And you can see here the siding matches the, um, the siding on the addition that was built after the house was relocated in 2008. Next. And this is looking um, from the other side from the rear. Next. And the next two slides are just um, a rendering showing what the new garage would look like next to the house. Next. And there's the colored one. Next. So in terms of our assessment of the, of the building, it's not in a heritage district, so we're not looking at district plan guidelines. We're looking at um, how the building is uh, impacts the heritage resource on the site, which of course is the house. So we consider it to be an appropriate, compatible new structure. It's been designed very simply. It is using materials that are already on the house in the new addition to make sure that it is coordinated and complements the house, but is still different and distinguished from the brick home. And the garage is set back from the front of the house. It's got a lower height and simple design. So again, the heritage house remains the prominent visual uh, structure on the property. And uh, there are no variances required for this application. Next. So the staff recommendation is for the approval of the garage with um, the condition that all final details on paint colors, doors, trim, and cladding be submitted to heritage planning staff for approval. And of course, that the permit expire two years from date of final approval by council. And I believe we've got uh, one of the owners and um, someone from the design firm, the architecture firm here as well, if you have any questions. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, do we have any questions of Carolyn? Councillor Duddick. Actually, Madam Chair, it's not a question. It's more of a comment just to commend um, the, uh, the architects and the owner for a very tastefully done uh, garage. And I commend them for not trying to increase living space above it, letting it remain um, what shall I say, you mentioned the word there, Carolyn, that the house is the prominent feature. And it's been very tastefully done in that regard. I'm very familiar with the house. I used to know the owners way back when. Anyway, I think it's very nicely done and it's a very limited lot. So it's, uh, it's understandable that there's considerable limitations. So at the appropriate time, I'd be pleased to give you a motion to approve. Thank you, Councillor Dedick. Do we have any other questions or comments uh, for Carolyn? None seen. Um, would the um, owners and architects uh, like to present? I believe, Madam Chair, they're here available for questions, but I, as far as I understand, they have nothing else they'd like to add um, at this time. 
Do we have any questions of uh, the architects or the owners by the committee members today? Madam Chair, I believe Sean Osborne did want to speak and that the architect and agent are available for questions. Okay, so Sean would like to speak then? I don't have anything further. <laughs> Oh. Um, a councillor that I couldn't have said anything more complimentary. So I have nothing further at this time. Thank you. Um, we have a motion on the table. Um, any anyone opposed to the motion? Uh, none opposed. The motion is carried for uh, the recommendation by staff as identified in the two items in our uh, staff report. Next item. Yes, and Madam Chair, just for the record, the motion is to um, approve the, the heritage permit application. Yes, um, it's to approve the heritage permit application for the construction of the new detached garage at 105 Palliser Court um, with uh, the provision as we have as attached in Appendix B to the report dated August 17 from Planning Services uh, subject to the, the that final details on paint colors, doors, trim, and cladding be submitted to heritage planning staff for final approval, and that this heritage permit expire two years from the date of final approval by council. Are we good, Madam Clerk? Y yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next item. Uh, 187 Front Street. Carolyn again? Yes, this is mine. I'll just wait for the presentation to pull up. You're all quite familiar with this one as you um, saw it at the end of last year with the site plan application came in. So we'll go to the next slide just as a reminder to everyone where it's located. It's on Front Street between Thomas and George Street and it's located in the old Oakville Heritage Conservation District. Next. So again, it designated as part of the district, uh, but contains a non-contributing 1965 house, which has um, there's support for that house to be removed and replaced with a new home. So the application is to demolish the existing house and construct a new two-story house. In terms of process, there was site plan approval required because it's within 15 meters of the lake. This process uh, was, or this application rather, was brought to the Heritage Committee in the, this past winter and comments were provided by the Heritage Committee. And um, this uh, application has been processed, but it's been approved conditional upon heritage permit approval. So we still need to get through the heritage permit process uh, for all of these things to get in place. The second one is the minor variance approval. Again, I'll go over those minor variances, but they were approved by the committee of adjustment. So today we're looking at the heritage permit uh, approval for the, the new home. Next. So the new home is a, is a contemporary design with gable roofs, large window openings, uh, but it still has a traditional form in terms of gable roofs. It has a front and rear balconies and the garage is located in the basement. This is one of the more unique features of this house. There is no longer going to be a garage facing uh, Front Street because it's located back to the rear uh, underneath the home. And as part of the site plan application that was reviewed, there was removal of two trees um, on the property. The minor variances that were required was a front yard setback of four meters, whereas a minimum of six meters is required. This was uh, requested because they wanted to have the house kept more in line with the adjacent homes on either side. And within the Heritage District Plan, there is a guideline saying that um, support can be given for minor variances to set setbacks to make a home more compatible or more consistent with the existing building fabric of the, the district. So this uh, minor variance was supported by heritage staff. The second one was a residential floor area of 43%, whereas maximum 30% is permitted. Again, this was triggered mostly by the garage being put into the basement. So it, it added that additional space there, uh, whereas it wouldn't have been counted if it was uh, done in the traditional you know, garage, attached garage at the front. And again, these two minor variances uh, were supported by staff and, and approved by the Committee of Adjustment. Next. Just a couple of photos um, of the property. So here you can't really see the house. It's a bit hidden there, um, but it's between the two other homes that you can see on the site and the picture. Next. Here's the 1960s home. Next. And a view from uh, further towards the east down the street. 
Next. And a closer up view. Next. So here's a site plan. Um, it may be easier for you to have seen in your agenda package. It's a lot of details in the site, but essentially you can see the new two-story home is being located towards the western portion of the property where the easterly side will be kept open. This is where currently there's uh, the deattached garage. So this will actually open up the space um, and allow for access to the property uh, and to the new garage at the bottom. Next. So here's another image of the home. We've got, again, gable roofs, simple design. Um, some of it has been changed, and I'll go over that um, in a later slide, but some of the details have been changed since the original site plan application was brought to the Heritage Committee based on their feedback. Next. A view from the east, again, showing how the garage would work. Next. A view from the rear. You can see the, the balcony there and the larger windows. Next. And this is the westerly view with a masonry chimney towards the front. Next. Uh, these are four plans. We'll just go to the next one. And two more floor plans. Those are just there for reference in case there are any questions. Next. And this is a uh, view show, shows the aerial view of the area and it's helpful to show uh, what is there existing in terms of the gray, you can see the gray roof of the existing building and the footprint outlined in white of the new proposed dwelling. So you can see that it's not much of a larger footprint. In fact, it's, it's I think it's actually somewhat smaller if you take away the garage because the garage has actually been moved underneath. And you can see again that it is um, oriented more towards the westerly side of the property. And the other part of it to see is the two setbacks at the front. On the westerly side, the setback uh, matches with the house to the west. And on the easterly side, the setback matches with the house to the east. Next. And here is a streetscape view showing how the house would fit into the existing streetscape. Again, the house to the west and east, both of them are quite low structures, um, one and one half story buildings. The existing house they're showing is um, two stories. They are permitted up to 10.5 meters. The original proposal was just over 10, and they're now down to 9.6 meters, I believe. So it has the height has been lowered since the application was seen by the Heritage Committee last year. Next. And here's a rendering showing how the house uh, would look with uh, vegetation. Again, this is another note that was feedback that came from the committee and to staff was to make sure that there's enough vegetation and, and trees put on the property um, to in, ensure that it still has that uh, greenery that exists today, but also just to make sure the house sits comfortably on the site within the Heritage District. Next. So just going over some of the comments, I've mentioned a couple of these that the Heritage Committee made. Um, one was that the house needs to be lower in height. Um, there were comments that the small scale of the adjacent houses may make it appear higher than it actually is, but there were still some feedback looking for a house that was a bit lower. Um, another one was since the house is higher than adjacent houses, considered keeping the six meter setback to have it farther set back from the road. There was concern with loss of foliage in the front yard. The house is was considered to be not overly contemporary and reimagines traditional concepts was another comment. The garage in the basement overall, I think everyone thought was a very successful design feature. And oh, the last final comment was consider addressing the southeast corner to make it more welcoming. So changes were made by the applicant as described. So the height of the house was lowered uh, further to 9.62 meters. Uh, the balcony was reduced in size and the design of the windows in the front was revised to create more traditional window divisions. So they have more slender mountain birds. They have a lighter appearance, more typical of older homes as opposed to the, the larger sort of chunkier mountain bars you see in newer homes. And finally, additional trees and soft landscaping was added to the front yard. Next. So again, we, the staff comments, um, we found the house as a simple form. It's rooted in traditional design, is a bit more contemporary and clean lined, but it still has the traditional gable roof, uh, traditional complementary materials of wood siding. They are proposing to use stone on the chimney and around the base of the home. And uh, one of the conditions is that from staff's recommendation is that the stone be made um, or found to match the traditional lake stone as much as possible. 
And finally, the location height and massing has been designed and adjusted uh, since the application came in so that the house sits comfortably in its setting within the Heritage Conservation District. Next. So this is the staff recommendation. I'll go through the conditions. We approve the rec recommend to approve the application subject to the stone that's installed in the chimney in the base of the house being a natural stone that replicates the local lake stone. And secondly, that all final details on paint colors, windows, doors, trim and cladding be submitted to staff for final approval. And of course the two year expiry as well. I know we have the owners, I believe Madam Chair, we also have the architect here. Uh, if you have any uh, questions of them and I'd be happy to answer questions as well. Thank you, Carolyn, for a very thorough uh, presentation, uh, particularly with uh, items that were raised at the last meeting and um, how the elements were addressed very thorough. Uh, this is a, a, a unique uh, proposal for the area, uh, but consideration has been made to integrate uh, and interpret the, the traditional forms, uh, albeit in a new way. Um, do we have any comments from uh, the committee on this application for Carolyn? George? Go ahead, George. I just saw Dave's hand go up at the, I was gonna let him go ahead, but quest, okay. I, just, I, I just have some concern about the, uh, the initial meeting we had. We discussed uh, height and massing and develop, but the height is still a, a problem area for me. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering why that hasn't been why that hasn't been further reduced because the plan calls for certain requirements under the procedures and one of the requirements is to ensure that the proposal will be sympathetic to the district's character and as you follow into and get to the guidelines the guidelines have to ensure compatibility with the existing built environment scale and height and mass may uh, be compatible so height i don't i just can't see how the uh, carolyn how the height is compatible especially when you look at the at the streetscape sketch it's a it's a two-story house if you take if you just the measurements aren't there of course i can't get it from the streetscape study but you've got a two-story house that's higher than the story and a half preceding it to the west and in fact it's higher than the garage in the initial house further west again it's and even though the road has sloped oh it's got to be how many feet i don't know three four feet at least maybe five it's too high why why does the why does the roof line have to be so much have so much peak on it for example i mean that might help it because at least it should be compatible in elevation with the house to the immediate west which is a story and a half i know it's replacing a story and a half house but that's that's one of the beauties of the plan is that it identifies how houses are nestled and tucked into areas like this, especially on the downslope. So that's my question, Carolyn, is how did everybody address the, the height situation and why did they dropped it, what, one foot maybe? Thank I, you, George. I, so your concern is the height and- right. And I don't, I don't think the, zone, this, as the zoning is allowed, but this is less, well, the zoning I can't see overtakes the plan that says it has to be compatible with the existing built environment. Okay, thank you, George. That's, that's sort of my question to it. Yeah, so George, you're right. Um, so zoning is one thing we look at, but obviously the heritage district plan, we still require uh, property owners in many cases to go well above and beyond what um, zoning permits, which again, which was what was done in this case. Um, even though they were well within zoning height, we still required and requested them to go further. I think our, our general response is that um, <coughs> if a, a home is surrounded by one and a half story homes within the Heritage District, there's no requirement necessarily to make all new homes be the same height. The idea really is to make it um, generally and overall consistent as opposed to um, perfectly sort of equal and consistent. So I don't know if you can see me visually right now, but I think the idea when we're looking at um, houses in the district, we wouldn't want to see low, 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 really high. But we try to kind of go with more of like, it's almost a, a visual of a wave effect. So you kind of go up and you go down. 
Um, there are little hills. We don't want to see huge peaks and valleys in terms of differentiation and height with new homes, but we will still permit, um, you know, homes, some homes to be higher than others and some homes to be lower. I think one of the other cases is to make sure that we're not um, permitting large homes that dominate right over other homes, um, you know, right next to them. In our opinion, from staff's opinion, we find this to be compatible because there is a difference in height, um, but not so much, though, that it is you know, absolutely dominating and overwhelming the existing heritage homes. And um, it is a difficult site because of the way the grading is and because we have two one and a half story homes on either side. But we do again have the two story house um, at Thomas, in the corner of Thomas. We've got two story homes across the street. So they are in the area and we do permit them. Um, and we did ask them to bring it down, you know, further than what they'd even proposed. And at this point, we feel comfortable with, with the difference in height from either side. And I guess that would just be a, our approach to, to answer that one. Thank you, Carolyn. Can I just, can I just ask again, and sorry, I didn't follow up that. It, it just seems that compatibility is an important word here and it has been throughout the, the, the district plan, but it has to be compatible with the existing built environment. I think you end up, from a location that's quite kind of house nestled in there. Really, it's not a heritage home, I realize that, but it was really unobtrusive as you went down the street. The houses, you can follow me, uh, traditionally came down this, the street on the follow the slope. Now you've got follows the slope and then this jutting house up in the middle of it, and then down to the lower part. It just doesn't seem to me to be compatible. That's why I was asking the question because I don't see how that fits compatibility yeah, I, be interested on your view of it. I think the difference um, in terms of how we approach it is that we don't consider compatibility to mean everything's the same and everything's perfectly consistent. Um, it's just making sure that it's not completely out of line with what's there. There again are going to be changes. There are going to be ups and downs in terms of the heights. Um, but from our perspective, this fits, even though it's not the same as what's there now and it's not the same as what's adjacent to it um, on the adjacent properties. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, George. Um, I appreciate, George, that there's going to be a difference of opinion in terms of interpretation of rhythm and scale and how um, buildings um, lend themselves to the experience on the street front. There is a there is the page 52 where it shows the um, uh, streetscape and it as Carolyn was mentioning there, you can get an idea of the rhythm that um, um, they were um, claiming uh, that they're uh, working towards. But, um, you know, appreciate your point of view, George. Um, Carolyn, thank you for the explanation. And again, we're going to, uh, you know, we understand that there will be a difference of opinion and a difference of interpretation on this issue. But um, we appreciate your, uh, your point of view, George. Councillor Giddings, you had something, um, a comment to make? Uh, thank you, Chair. It was a question for uh, Carolyn as well, if I may. Uh, Carolyn, you talk about the uh, garage being underneath and the 40 that led to the 43% uh, GFA. Is that, would you be able to back out that number and tell us what the percentage would be without the, uh, without the uh, garage underneath? Um, through you, Madam Chair, to Councilor Giddings, I don't have that information. Um, I, we could get it, of course, from the planner who dealt with the application, but from a community adjustment perspective, from a heritage perspective with community adjustment, minor variance applications, we don't get too down in the details in terms of the numbers because our biggest concern is really the impact visually um, on the heritage uh, district. And so when we looked at it, of course, we had no significant concerns with the massing and bulk and size of the home. We're happy to see the garage in a different place. So we weren't getting into all the individual numbers the way the Committee of Adjustment uh, would and the Committee of Adjustment Planner did. I'm not entirely sure, but the, the applicants, uh, the, the um, architect may be able to answer that question for you. All right. Uh, I would appreciate that. Uh, we'll see if there are any more questions to the architect. My other question was regarding uh, the uh, stone installed to be a natural stone that replicates local late stone. At various times, we have had donations or supplies of late stone. Has that been discussed with the applicant in terms of whether there is enough there because Instead of replicating that, it would be handy if we were able to make use of the original. 
Yes, I believe they're already um, attempting to try to get some traditional original lake stone. As you said, there are always times where it comes up and we always try to make sure we make contact between people who are able to give it out and people who need it. So this is a perfect example of a time where um, we would love to make that connection and we are going to be working with the applicants to see if that can be done so that actual historic lake stone, original lake stone can be used rather than new material. Thank you, Carolyn. And Madam Chair, I'll, I'll provide uh, the motion for the staff recommendation at the appropriate time. Thank you, Councillor Giddings. Thank you, Carolyn. Any further questions of Carolyn? None. Um, would the um, owner and agent for the owner like to present at this point? Or are there any questions of the, of the committee to the architect and the owner? Let's put it that way. No questions of the uh, applicant. So we're going to, um, we have a motion on the table to um, uh, pass staff recommendation uh, that uh, the heritage permit application for the demolition of the existing house and the construction of a new two-story house at 187 Front Street as attached in Appendix B to the report dated August 17 from the planning services be approved subject to the following, that the stone installed on the chimney and the base of the house be a natural stone that replicates local lake stone as closely as possible, if not lake stone itself, if they can find the material, and that the final details on paint colors, windows, doors, trim and cladding be submitted to heritage planning staff for final approval, and that this heritage permit expired two years from the date of final approval by council, by council, and we have a motion by Councillor Giddings. Uh, any anyone opposed to the motion? Uh, we have one opposed to the motion. Motion is carried. Next item. 262 Randall Street. Pardon, Mr. Mrs. Adam Chairman. Sorry, I. Yes, Normally we, we restricted discussion to oh. the board and I didn't, uh, to the committee, I didn't hear any motion to that effect. You're correct, George, either, my apologies. Either, be, either you're for it or against it and that's all I heard. So yes, I just, George, I just had one comment at the end. I just, I just want to get on the record with this because the, the, the guidelines are clear. I mean, I, everybody has different interpretations, but the guidelines say that part of it says scale and height to be compatible with the surrounding buildings to ensure visual connectedness and existing sense of scale. In, in my view, it's, it's not been followed. And, and Carolyn, just in, in, in uh, five minutes ago or so, used the phrase, they're concerned about the impact visually. Well, uh -huh. that currently is, is sub A of 3.28, the vision. I don't know, I just, uh, Sorry, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think that people are, are reading a plan, understanding the plan, what, where the plan is coming from, and and the whole uh, philosophy behind it. And, and what I was then going to say, since obviously I wasn't going to be carrying any weight in this at all, that surely in the your recommendation that landscaping should be included as well, since that's throughout the uh, throughout the uh, the right up here they're talking about they want to retain the uh, character and, and the uh, land and the trees and scrub shrubs. so i think landscaping should be on there as as uh one of the recommendations. to the motion under sub b to the motion okay people would agree to that thank you george so, uh, sorry to be so long-winded no Not that's sure. that's fine we appreciate your comments we understand this is close to your heart um the only thing I can say from the presentation, there are two items in this presentation that really stand out and clearly demonstrate, um, mm -hmm. I guess, the integration into the district, the fact that it's not overextending itself. And that is uh, page 51 of the presentation, which uh, shows the site plan. It shows the house overlaid on top of the new house overlaid on top of the existing house to show that it actually has a smaller footprint than the than the existing house in terms of massing. And, and again, the street streetscape 
kind of uh, image that I referred to earlier. But um, your your comments are duly noted, George, and uh, and appreciated. And I think, um, Carolyn, would you agree that the landscaping component can be an addition to uh, as an item C on the recommendation? Yes, Madam Chair, that's no problem. And it will also be covered through the site plan process as well. Okay, so how would we like to put phrase that, uh, that additional landscaping be included? Um, so that final details on landscaping, paint colors, etc. So we'll just so, put sure. trim and planting and landscaping. Just add in and landscaping. Sure. All right. Thank you. Is that thank you, George. Madam Chair, for the record, I, I need to be clear on what what is the the amend. It's a friendly amendment to the motion. Then, is it a new C or is it just the wording added to Clause One B? Yes. Yes. Um, Madam Clerk, there is one word added to Item B, and that is um, uh, beside um, cladding. There is cladding and la and landscaping. So the word landscaping is an addition in uh, the item B. So it would be uh, the, that final details on paint colors, windows, doors, trims, cladding, and landscaping be submitted to heritage planning staff for final approval. And Madam Chair, through the mover, Councillor Giddings, that is taken as a friendly amendment and then to recall the vote. Yes. Councillor Giddings, are we good with that? Yes, we have a, a thumbs up from Councillor Giddings. I believe the motion is, is carried then, Madam Clerk. As amended. Uh, I take it that yes, that, that main motion is, is carried with the amendment, but let's just have a show of hands for the record. Yes. Can we have a show of hands? to carry the motion as amended. Okay. Thank you. That's carried, Madam Chair. Yes, that is carried. Okay, shall we proceed on to the next item? I think this is Susan 262 Randall Street. This one is mine as well. Oh, it's yours, Carolyn. Yeah. You're on a lot today. Yeah, well, I think this will, this will be an easy one. I think we can get a unanimous vote on this one. Um, you're all quite familiar with St. John's United Church in downtown. Uh, you're a couple older photos of the church in Lost Call that was, we'll be celebrating, I think it's 100th anniversary soon. Uh, next slide. So this is showing in blue the site that we're looking at um, that staff is proposing to move to designate. And again, of course, it's corner of Randall and Dunn. Um, and you can see the original 1877 house and the, or sorry, church rather, and the Lost Call built uh, in the 1920s. Next. So again, these are the two portions that we're looking at proposing to designate. Um, the, we've looked at and reviewed the property and uh, done an assessment of it. And we've got different aspects that we believe that are, uh, make it worthy of designation under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. So that's what we're proposing today. So in terms of its design and physical value, uh, it's a well-executed representative example of Gothic revival and the neo-Gothic revival architectural styles. And both of these portions of the buildings contain numerous highly crafted design, type, design details of these two styles. Historically, there's a lot of heritage value. Um, the building has a lot of history with the Wesleyan um, Methodist Church history, which goes way back to the early 19th century in Oakville and Trafalgar Township. And it's also got a lot of heritage value for its association with the development of, of Oakville. Many significant citizens attended this church and a lot of events have happened here over the years that have been really part of the community um, and the fabric and life of, of Oakville over the many years. And finally, the contextual value of the building is considered to be a landmark within downtown Oakville. It's physically, functionally, visually, and historically linked to its surroundings. It's a building that's very prominent and well known to everyone. And if it was to be lost, it would have a huge impact on uh, the fabric of the downtown. Next. Just a few photos of the property I think all of you are quite familiar with. 
in terms of the um, notice that we put together, a draft notice that was attached, it includes all of the heritage attributes that we are recommending to, that would be included in a, a, a future designation. We've been working with the Board of Trustees for the church um, to look at this designation and all of these attributes to make sure everyone's on board with them. It's trying to find that balance of protecting the heritage elements that are really important while considering what changes could happen to this church in the future. As we know, with churches, um, a lot of things have changed for a lot of church communities, and sometimes buildings have had to adapt or change and move with the times. Um, even looking at this photo, you can see where the parking lot was um, to the south it has been a new development over the years as, as it happened. So the idea is to really make sure we're protecting the heritage elements of the buildings to ensure that they're going to be there for the long term. Uh, while considering that some changes, of course, will happen to the buildings. And, and in that case, we've only included, um, in terms of an interior feature, the original balconies of the cast iron columns and, uh, and, and metal railings. So that's been included as a feature in the interior. Otherwise, we've left it fairly open so that there could be different possibilities in the future for the interiors of these buildings. I'll uh, go to the next slide, just showing more photos. So you can, you know, or you can see here the, the brick, um, the windows, the stained glass windows, some of the historic doors and the door openings. These have been included in the list of heritage attributes. Next, this is looking back to the rear. Um, the one story portion that you can see at the rear uh, where that the new side door was that put in, this has not been included in the designation. And the same goes for the uh, vestibule at the very front, which was added in the 1950s. So those two portions from the 50s and 60s have not been included um, in the list of, <clears throat> excuse me, in the list of heritage attributes. Next. So the staff recommendation today <clears throat> is just that a notice of intention to designate be issued for the property. Again, we've been working with the church community, so everyone has been on board with this designation. It's the last historic church, um, especially in the downtown area, to be designated. So we're really happy uh, that we've been able to work with the church to get to this um, conclusion. So it's very exciting for everyone. Um, in terms of process, we're recommending that a notice be issued to designate to the Heritage Committee today. We will take a similar report to Council at their next meeting uh, in September, the Planning and Development Council, to make that same recommendation. Then a notice will be issued um, in the paper and, uh, and anyone would have a chance and opportunity to, um, to appeal that or to rather to, to show their opinion that they would like to, the building not to be designated. Um, we are hopeful that won't happen because again, we've been working with the church on this one. And uh, once that period has passed, um, we would move forward with working again with the church to pass a designation bylaw, which would be based on the information you have in the attached notice. So that's all the information I have for you. We do have George Chisholm, who's just representing the church. I know he um, has, has told me he had nothing else to present or add, but he's here to answer questions in case there are any. Well, thank you very much, Carolyn. This is such wonderful news. This is, uh, this, this calls for shouts of delight. Um, and we'd like to commend uh, the owners and, and you and staff that uh, have brought this treasure in for designation, uh, for the potential for designation. This is just such wonderful news and, and uh, a wonderful thing to happen for, for this building. Um, so this is a, a notice for us. We don't actually have to move on this. We just receive the information. Um, do we have any comments from uh, the committee uh, of Carolyn or of the representative uh, of the church, George Chisholm? Any comments, Councillor Giddings? Uh, a comment just in terms of uh, long overdue. It's, it's wonderful, uh, wonderful to see the recognition as we have a number of properties uh, that are coming forward. And I, th I think it speaks well of our interest in heritage and our, and our our thoughts of the past and onto the future. So at the appropriate time, I'd happily uh, move the staff recommendation into a seat. Thank you, Councillor Giddings. Yes, it is It is really well done of all parties involved. Such a, such a relief. Uh, George, question? Uh, you might have to unmute there, George. Are you having problems unmuting? 
Madam Clerk, are you able to uh, unmute George from your end? Unmute. Ah, there, success. that worked finally. I had something wrong with my machine here. No, I just wanted to thank Carolyn for the work. I mean, that's a, an awful lot of work that's uh, gone into that project. So uh, congratulations, because you've, you've got all the details and all the little bits and pieces that are really important to uh, to preserve these these buildings in the downtown area. So again, thank you. Great work. Thank you. Thank you, George. Yeah. Anyone else? So, um, Madam Clerk, we receive the notice of intention to designate um, as uh, as issued under Section 29, Part 4 of the Interior Heritage Act for St. John's United Church at 262 Randall Street. Anything else required of us at this point? Madam Clerk? Uh, Madam Chair, just uh, a note that I have Catherine Hurley who is called into the but I don't have her uh, as registered. Did we need to check in with her? Uh, well, I think it's a matter of process. It's it's up to you, Madam Clerk, because um, we have uh, delegations have to register at 12 noon uh, the day before the meeting. So I think this is in your purview. I'll, uh, right, I'll defer Clark. to your decision on that. Yeah, no, I've had no contact with Catherine Hurley. I, I'm just noting that uh, I have her uh, in the meeting. But yeah, the committee's fine. There was no, nothing further of George Chisholm who was available for questions. So thank you. Okay. Councillor Giddings. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Do we know whether the person that's called in was wanted to speak on this item or another item? Well, that, Madam Clerk. that's why I was noting that I do have another uh, caller in. So if, if I can just go to her for a moment or unless Carolyn or Sue know. Madam oh. Clerk, I have not I've been in contact with Ms. Hurley about um, any of my items. Okay, thank you. We'll just revel in the good news while Madam Clerk um, checks a few things here and send good thoughts to 262 Randall Street. Such a pleasure. Well, Madam Chair, I've asked Catherine Hurley to unmute and I'm not getting a response. So again, um, you're right. She has not pre-registered on an item, but I had her in the meeting. So uh, we're good to go with uh, you calling the vote. Okay, uh, well, as this is a, a notice to receive, I don't believe we need a vote, right? Well, Madam Chair, we still need the motion, uh, the staff recommendation. You're voting okay. on the recommendation before you that the notice of intent be issued for item 4.3. Uh, and who would like to move that the notice of, okay, I have, well, why don't we let George take this one? M Madam George? Chair, Councillor Giddings had already um, moved the motion. I'm glad you're here, Madam Clerk. Keeping us all in order, <laughs> Councillor well, Giddings. Uh, unless Councillor Giddings would like to pass it on to, to George Gordon, uh, we do have a uh, mover on the floor. I, oh. I certainly would. I uh, <laughs> Sorry, I meant to say that uh, uh, George Gordon's hand was up, so I was just trying to help you out, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll have Councillor Giddings' motion to receive the recommend uh, to um, for the recommendation. Sorry, Madam Chair. I believe Councillor Giddings just passed the motion on to George Gordon to recognize that his hand was up. For the record. <laughs> okay. We will have George passing this motion. All in favor? Wonderful. Any opposed? None. Motion is carried.
Madam Chair, I have gravel at the ready if anyone has motion sickness. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Dunnick. <laughs> Wonderful. Are we ready for our next item? And I think Carolyn can take a break on this one. Uh, the next item is 1150 Dundas Street West. And I believe this is Susan's case. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so it's another good news story for us. Uh, the, the property at uh, 1150 Dundas Street West is the home of Knox 16 Presbyterian Church and Cemetery. Uh, next slide, please. You'll all remember this because we uh, did see the phase two cultural heritage evaluation report for the cultural heritage landscape of this property um, in October of last year. And so uh, just as a refresher, the property is located on Dundas Street West right at the corner of Lions Valley Park Road. Um, and it includes uh, both a historic church building and uh, a historic yet still operating um, cemetery. Next slide, please. And so back in October of last year, um, after review from Heritage Oakville, Town Council endorsed phase two report, uh, which recognized uh, this property as a significant cultural heritage landscape and then directed staff to proceed to phase three, which is the implementation of protection measures through the cultural heritage landscape strategy. And so, um, Property uh, NOC 16 is already designated by bylaw 1978-085. However, as this is one of the town's earlier heritage designation bylaws, it doesn't include the information that is required by current uh, standards and legislation being the revised and updated Ontario Heritage Act. And so uh, while we are always happy to work with property owners to update uh, these outdated bylaws, in the case of NOC 16, We've taken that a step further um, in regards to the assessment of the property as a cultural heritage landscape, not just as a built heritage structure. Next slide, please. And so uh, what we're moving forward with is uh, the notice of intention to designate. Uh, that includes a description of the property, the statement of cultural heritage value or interest, uh, which then looks at three different categories itself. We look at the um, historic or associative value, the design physical value and the contextual value and the description of the heritage attributes of the property. And all of those things are set out in um, Appendix A to the staff report, which is the draft notice of intention to designate. It is a rather uh, lengthy um, draft notice because this is, um, you know, it's, it's a small church, but it's got an awful lot to offer. Uh, there are a number of details that need to be included both in the church building and in the various elements of the, the cemetery. And as well, we're looking at protecting some of the interior features of the church itself. Next slide, please. And so our next steps here are to serve the notice um, uh, if it's approved by council on September 13th. Um, the notice uh, serving requirements by the Ontario Heritage Act are that we publish in a local newspaper and send um, the, uh, the notice to the property owners and also to the Ontario Heritage Trust. Um, and then also to carry forward with the conservation plan for the cultural heritage landscape. And I'd like to say that this is very well in hand. We will have it uh, ready to go um, uh, pretty much immediately following the closure of the objection period to the notice of intention to designate, assuming that we have no objections. Um, we've been working with uh, the wardens and um, uh, ministerial staff and congregation of Knox 16 throughout this entire process. They're an absolute delight to work with. Um, it's been such a wonderful process and we're so happy to be able to uh, support them with a, a better designation bylaw and um, in the future a conservation plan that will give us all uh, easier information on how to manage change to this property but also to support it through the town's heritage grant program. Um, next slide please. And so uh, the staff recommendation is that we issue the notice of intention to designate um, uh, for Knox 16 Church and Cemetery Cultural Heritage Landscape uh, as identified in Appendix A. And that is the draft notice uh, itself. Um, and uh, that uh, 
that the notice be issued. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer any. I don't believe we have representatives from the church online today, but they may be watching uh, live on town TV. Um, and as I said, it, it has been a, a wonderful process to work with them. And I'm so pleased to bring this report forward for you today. Thank you, Susan. This is, uh, this is again, again, another shout of delight uh, for this, uh, for this building. And um, again, a good uh, commendation for you and the owners of the building uh, to bring this this far ahead. Uh, it's, uh, again, such a good news story. And thank you again. It's good to have um, any questions or comments from uh, for Susan. I see Castor Duddick's hand is up and uh, she has the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wanted to add my voice to thanks to uh, Susan and the rest of Heritage staff who worked so well with this congregation. They're a smaller congregation, but really have to give full credit to them for being such good stewards of this beautiful building. And it's one of the reasons that I think that so many of us on the Heritage Grant Program were so um, eager to endorse their applications for funds to support them in their stewardship of this property. So well done by all, and I'd be pleased to give you a motion to approve. Thank you, Councillor Dudek, and I uh, second your comments on that. It, it is a pleasure. It is a pleasure to give, uh, you know, grants to, to such a building and to see that um, the heritage is carried forward in, in such a positive way for, uh, for the benefit of all the community. Um, if there are no further questions uh, of uh, Susan, um, we'll have uh, Councillor um, Dudek um, pass the motion, uh, the recommendation as stated previously and as in the report uh, in the slide. Uh, all, uh, any opposed? None, none opposed. The motion is carried as identified in the recommendation uh, on screen. Madam Clerk, are we okay on this one? Or do I need to read it out? Uh, that's fine, Madam Chair, that the, um, this is staff recommendation to approve for the notice of intention. Perfect, okay. Motion carried. Next item, that's you again, Susan, on um, Old Oakville Heritage Conservation District work plan. I think this is a, a long awaited uh, news for us. Glad to see this on the agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I realize I was remiss in my last report to not recognize the contributions of Elaine Eigel on the Knox 16 project. And so I just want to put it out there uh, that uh, Elaine has been instrumental in uh, bringing forward the work on the cultural heritage landscape for Knox 16. Um, and so uh, that's, a, that's a thanks to Elaine as well. Um, thank you. And so moving forward with an update on the old Oakville Heritage Conservation District. Um, this is an exciting project for us, uh, one that uh, should have been started um, uh, probably last year, but unfortunately, we all know what happened last year. Our words, worlds were turned somewhat upside down and things got put on hold. Um, but we are very happy to be bringing forward uh, the launch of the old Oakville Heritage Conservation District update. Next slide, please. So this Heritage Conservation District, which is Oakville's first, um, the legwork for this project went in uh, between 1979, 1980, and it had to go through approval, not just through town council, but at that time, according to legislation, all Heritage District plans had to go to the Ontario Municipal Board, whether or not there was an objection or not. And so the old Oakville Heritage Conservation District was finally approved by uh, the OMB on uh, July 5th of 1982. And so this is our first real update uh, to that district plan. Um, it includes uh, the area from Allen Street to the 16 Mile Creek and then between Lake Ontario and the southern lot lines of properties that um, front onto Robinson Street and that was the map that you saw on our first slide and I know the committee members are all very familiar with it. The district plan has served Oakville's community so very well for the past 40 years and has been 
uh, incredibly instrumental in maintaining the unique character of this residential neighborhood. Um, and so the plan has been wonderful in um, achieving Oakville's heritage conservation goals. However, of course, the Ontario Heritage Up uh, Act has been updated in both 2005 and just very recently in 2021. And so we need to take a look at the plan um, to update it to meet the requirements of current legislation. I would like to note that the existing plan and designation remain in place throughout this entire process until a new plan is adopted and fully through the objection period. Um, so there will be no, uh, no time where the heritage district is unprotected through this process. It's just that the uh, requirements of the Ontario Heritage Act actually don't have a process to amend or update a heritage district. And so we have to go through the whole process all over again. But given that it's been quite a while since we've done that, uh, it's probably not the worst idea anyways. Next slide, please. And so one of the first things you have to do when you're looking at designate a heritage conservation district is to complete the study. And so that uh, study that we have in place was completed between 1979 and 1980. And so we need to do some updated information. Uh, we will certainly be reusing some of the historic research uh, completed for that study, um, you know, uh, some, you know, some facts don't change, but we will be looking at certainly at introducing um, new historic information uh, to uh, provide more context about uh, First Nations history in the area, and then also looking at updating the inventory of the indiv individual properties throughout the Heritage Conservation District, because while we all recognize that a heritage district conserves heritage, it doesn't stop heritage, uh, doesn't stop change, it just manages it. And so there has been considerable change throughout, you know, the past 40 years. <laughs> um, and so what we're looking at is undertaking the first draft of that study in-house uh, this winter, and that would be largely completed, um, I think, by, probably by myself and by, uh, uh, with assistance from Elaine, who is our tremendous researcher. Uh, next slide, please. So the big thing about heritage conservation districts um, is the necessity to involve and engage the public. Um, and so that means um, that we will be looking at a couple of different uh, strategies to engage and consult with uh, the public and stakeholders on this heritage district update. And so the fir very first thing will be um, a notice that will be uh, mailed out to all property owners in the old Oakville Heritage Conservation District, giving them um, you know, the heads up that the update is about to start and giving them an opportunity to provide their email contact to uh, the town for specific purposes of staying informed on what's going on with the Heritage Conservation District update, which will then lead forward to um, more uh, consultation sessions as uh, the study progresses. And so there are two main uh, phases, I guess, of a Heritage Conservation District update. And so the first, as I've mentioned, is the study, updating that background information in the inventory. Um, the communication through this phase will be largely based through electronic communication and information sharing. And so we'll be reaching out to stakeholders, which isn't just property owners, but also um, you know, the residents associations who represent the property owners, the Oakville Museum and the Historical Society who are both within the district area, as well as those who work in the area, including realtors, uh, architects and planners. And all of these people will be asked to provide information regarding the history of the area and uh, the properties within it. So re really it's an information gathering stage. The more intense um, phase of the district update will be during the um, update, which will be an entirely new set of plan and guidelines. And this will be led by a consultant team working with staff. And so this is the phase that will require extensive communication and participation from the stakeholders. And it will be um, a process that actually gets developed as we uh, move forward um, uh, with the study process. Next slide, please. And so this is a, a general timeline. Um, uh, Appendix A to the staff report has a, a work plan chart. These are all uh, these are all goals. They're not written in stone. And I just note that because we need to remain flexible on some of these processes 
in order to deal with not unforeseen circumstances, but um, uh, you know, circumstances that uh, change. And that uh, very you know big one would be uh, how we're able to interact with the public due to uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic. And so, starting off with the study process this fall is is a good thing because it doesn't uh, rely so heavily on um, public engagement and you know in depth uh, workshops and things like that. And so, as I mentioned, staff will be undertaking that first draft. Uh, we hope to have the first draft done by the end of this year. That's uh, the fourth quarter. And then we'll be looking at a request for proposals process starting uh, right away when we get back in the first quarter of 2022. And we do need to wait for budget approval. So that's one of the reasons why we're not going to tackle that until January. Um, and as soon as we have consultants on board, the very first thing that they're going to be doing is developing the public engagement strategy um, and getting that approved um, through staff to make sure that we feel that there's an appropriate level of consultation and flexibility to deal with um, our circumstances. And so then the public engagement itself will probably begin in the spring um, of uh, 2022 and carry out through to the late summer, early fall uh, before bringing forward a new draft plan to um, Heritage Oakville and Council for review. Uh, we are hoping that we'll have a final plan by the uh, fourth quarter, by the end of 2022. But again, I would note that these are tentative dates. They're their goals and if there is a need for additional public engagement and consultation or if things get pushed back um, because we can't have the type of consultation sessions we need due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we may be pushing into 2023 because we do recognize that different people are more comfortable participating in different types of public engagement strategies. Um, you know, we, we certainly hope to be able to have some in-person uh, meetings because I feel they're, they're very helpful uh, to work through um, uh, you know, the pros and cons and, and providing feedback, but I do expect there will be a certain uh, degree of electronic um, consultation as well. And we'll have to work through that as our circumstances allow. Next slide, please. And so um, I'm simply asking that the uh, report be received. We are bringing forward a similar version of this report to Planning and Development Council in September to ensure that they're fully updated on how we're planning to move forward with this. Um, and if there are any questions or comments, I'm happy to receive them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Susan. Um, wow, uh, that's uh, that's quite an undertaking. I hadn't realized it's uh, 40 years since the, the first uh, report was um, um, enacted, I guess, on this one. Um, it reminds me of when, uh, as a student in 1978, I worked for LACAC in Burlington, and we were beginning the inventory of uh, historic homes, and that was a, a lifetime and a half ago. So, wow, uh, so much time. This is a very uh, assertive, I don't want to say aggressive schedule, but you have a lot of work uh, ahead of you in, in such little time, and hopefully, you know, with... Uh, the situation we have with COVID, it will uh, all the all the stars will will align for you. Um, but this is uh, this is quite um, a welcome uh, study uh, for the area. It's uh, it's about time. And I was just going to say that um, probably a really good uh, resource for this would be uh, the local architects would have probably an inventory of homes of heritage homes they've renovated through the last four decades, and that would. Uh, provide quite a nice uh, line of um, evolution on these historical buildings that might be really useful for the consultant team. So, uh, so looking forward to seeing the next phase of this. Thank you very much, Susan. Do we have any questions of Susan, Councillor Duddick? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to uh, commend my colleague, Councillor Dave Giddings and his colleague, Councillor Janet Hazlitt Thiel for their strong advocacy in moving this up the um, job jar, as Drew would often reference. Um, it is extremely important. And I am suggesting, and I don't know whether it should be done here or whether I should wait and introduce it at Council, but I seriously think we should think about introducing an interim control bylaw. And the reason being that 
we have such, um, well, almost every meeting we have something in this district on our agenda. And there always seems to be a discrepancy or a difference of opinion regarding the current plan, what is being proposed, what should be uh, protected by a part four. I'm thinking of 176 Front Street, which I couldn't believe was not a part four designation. And the, the comments in the report um, indicating that even though it's part of a district, give it more teeth, it should have a part four designation, such as the Warren doorstep and others that are in this particular district. The reason I'm saying with the interim control bylaw, I'm worried about applications that we may have coming in, in between our approval and the public consultation process for this district that um, we're gonna be setting ourselves up for a really contestable and very, um, what should I say, variable difference of opinion. So again, I'll leave that with staff if they might be able to come back with something at the planning and development force in the future uh, when it's introduced at council. Um, but again, um, given the amount of applications and the considerable change we see, in the applications, I think we'd be very, very unwise not to seize this opportunity. And for those who may not be familiar, an interim control bylaw will basically give it that pause that we need so that we're not making decisions outside of this public process where people will be commenting. So I'll leave that with you and with staff, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dedick. So I guess in summary, you're concerned that the existing uh, bylaws as they stand won't be sufficient to Correct. protect the, the remainder that we have, the heritage Correct. resort that we have. Okay, thank you. I guess, it's, Susan, did you want to um, add anything, uh, comment on uh, Councillor Duddick's concerns or just carry forward uh, within staff? Um, I'm, Madam Chair, I'm happy to uh, work with Diane and Gabe to um, come up with wording that the councillor may want to include for Planning and Development Council. Okay, thank you. Is that sufficient for that's, you? That's great, Susan. Similar to what we did with Glen Abbey, where we have an interim control bylaw to give us that opportunity to do the fulsome um, studies and consultation that's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve the, rec the staff recommendation? Councillor Giddings, fittingly. Uh, uh, well, actually, I also have a comment, if I may, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, okay. I'd, like to th uh, I'd like to thank Councillor Duddock and thrilled to see this report come back so quickly in terms of uh, future plans. My one concern I have is uh, if staff could take us through the process a little bit, uh, it talks about the uh, first phase of the project will likely be restricted to electronic communication. Just looking for clarification that that is uh, restricted to the area for the time being for information gathering. Is that correct? Susan, uh, to you. Um, uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Giddings, I'm not entirely sure. Do you mean like, will we only be receiving electronic communication to and from the property owners or the entire stakeholder group? Well, it talks about the public engagement during the study, mm -hmm. that the uh, study phase is likely be restricted to electronic communication and information sharing. I just wanted to make sure that that's during the information gathering stage as was referred uh, through you madam chair yes that is that is really what we're talking about but electronic communication also doesn't uh, preclude the uh, you know uh, hosting zoom meetings for people who are interested to provide feedback in a more a kind of open setting rather than just via email um so um you know i a heritage conservation district study is required to come back to Heritage Oakville itself, uh, which is a public forum and to planning and development council. 
when I say we're planning on having the first draft ready by the end of this year, I don't mean that we're going to have it approved by the end of this year. I think it's important for us to complete the first draft in-house and then to give um, our consultants a chance to look at it um, and, uh, you know, identify any areas of weakness, make sure that we've got everything nice and tidy before we bring it forward to um, uh, to Heritage Oakville and, uh, and Council, and that will likely happen sometime early in 2022. Um, you know, if there are feelings from council that we need to extend our public consultation during the study phase, more than happy to look at uh, other alternative options. Um, I'm just concerned that we won't, um, we don't need to get into the details of the plan and guidelines, which I know is what most people really want to talk about when we do the district update. And so that because the study really is about uh, looking at um, uh, the historic background, which then create, you know, creates our statement of cultural heritage value and interest for the area too. So um, I, we're, we're happy to take any uh, additional direction that council might have to offer on enhancements to those strategies. Uh, uh, Thank you, Susan. Um, uh, through you, Madam Chair, I really appreciate the response. And I think as, as uh, council has shown, whether it be through the downtown streetscape study or the cultural hub or uh, the harbor study or uh, our growth nodes, that it will certainly be a fulsome and, and mm -hmm. iterative process. So I thank you for that. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, to clarify, Councillor Giddings, were you concerned about the scope of information gathering that it be restricted to the study um, or open to the broader Oakville community? Was that part of your concern? Well, uh, there will be time, I believe that there'll be, or there will be time for those discussions and questions once um, we get the parameters in place. And as, as you said, the feedback possibly from architects that have done work in the area and the historical society and the stakeholders in the area. But after that, certainly, uh, our expectation is with everything else, it will be town wide for everyone to provide. Mm -hmm. for them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Giddings. Thank you, Susan. Um, do we have a motion to approve the recommendation? Okay. Um, Bob Ferguson, we haven't heard from you. So Bob is um, uh, putting the motion to approve the- yeah, I'll uh, move that as a motion. Okay, very good. All in favor? Okay, any opposed? Motion is carried. And um, there are, well, that was a nice meeting today. And we're all looking forward to getting back to the heat of the day outside. Um, there are no information items listed for this agenda. And the date and time of the next meeting is Tuesday, September 21st, 2021. I just wanted to reiterate what I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, that if there, uh, if any applicant or member of the public uh, wishing to speak further regarding an issue on the Oakville, um, Heritage Oakville Advisory Committee agenda of today, uh, they may appear before Planning and Development Council at its meeting on Monday, September 13 at 6 30 p.m. when the recommendations from today's meeting will go forward for final consideration by council. Um, may we uh, thank you everyone for uh, showing up for today and for all your participation and your uh, and your comments and feedback. Um, may we have a motion to uh, adjourn today's meeting? Sorry Madam Chair. Um, at the beginning yes, and at the beginning of the meeting, when regrets were called, I did not have the chance to mention Carrie Colburn. Ah. When you called out the regrets. Okay. So just to note that Carrie Colburn uh, had sent her regrets today. Yes. Very good. Thank you, Madam Clerk. May we have a mo so may we have a motion to adjourn? So we do have the motion, Ferguson. <laughs> I thought uh, I did. Motion. I, I might need that pill, Councillor Duddick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I Good think job, Madam Chair. Good job. <laughs> oh, we missed Drew, don't we? <laughs>
I hope his ears are burning today and all is well with him. Have a beautiful day, everybody. And thank you for coming. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Your assistance is uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you, Madam Chair.